Good morning, and I say that because I come to you and we come together with such a grateful heart, just like Thanksgiving. We're so grateful to be here, to worship together, and to honor our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So in his name, in the matchless name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I welcome you to Beverly Heights Church. If you're visiting with us, we want to extend a warm welcome to you as well. And to those who are watching on our live streaming, we welcome you. And we hope that someday you will be able to come here and worship with us in person. We are delighted as elders to also welcome the Devlin family who are here. Welcome, Devlin family. So let's take a moment to greet one another with thankful hearts. I'll invite you to head back to your seats so I can bring a few announcements to your attention this morning. First of all, if you have children in our child care rooms downstairs, you should have received an email that our child care rooms are going to be closed for the first part of the service, but they'll be open uh, right when all the children are dismissed. In the bulletin, there's a spot where children are dismissed, so we invite you at that point to take your little ones down, so that'll be nursery and walkabouts rooms will open then, as well as runabouts, which typically opens at that time anyway. In lieu of our Thanksgiving service on Thanksgiving Day, we will be celebrating Thanksgiving Sunday next week. Since it is not the first Sunday in Advent until December, we have uh, a beautiful Thanksgiving Sunday service planned for you Well, we're going to um, incorporate some elements of our traditional Thanksgiving service into that. And so we hope you'll be able to be here with us next Sunday. If you're not traveling, uh, we invite you to come and join us on Sunday for worship. And then uh, save the date. I invite you to pick up a copy of Gathered Seeds because some of our Advent events are listed there with some information and save the date information. And so uh, mark your calendars. That first Sunday in Advent, December 3rd, will be our Advent family celebration. Our animals are lined up to be here out on the front lawn. And so we are really excited for that event. There'll be a few changes to it. It won't be quite as we've done it in the past, but we're really excited to have that opportunity to gather together as a church family so that'll be on December 3rd, and then you can mark your calendars as well. Our littlest one's birth to kindergarten. The birthday party for Jesus will be on December 16th, and um, that will be in the morning that Saturday. So we hope you can join us for uh, some of those things, but we are excited um, to celebrate our Thanksgiving with you next Sunday. Thanks. At this time, I would like to invite you to prepare your hearts for worship.
Please join me in our invitation to worship printed in your bulletin. Lord Jesus Christ, make us one. Please pray with me. Gracious God and loving Heavenly Father, we come into your presence this morning to glorify your holy name, to affirm your authority over us. We want to know you, the only true God, and we want to know your truth. Open our heads to know you, open our hearts to receive you, and open our hands to keep you. Receive from us, O Holy One, the glory due to your name as we humbly approach you in the name of your Son, the High Priest, who sits at your right hand. 
Help us, O Lord, through the power of the Spirit whom you have sent to give ourselves like you have. Like you have through the ultimate sacrifice, our King, Jesus Christ. For it is in his name that we pray. Amen. Our opening hymn this morning is O for a Thousand Tongues to Sing, can be found in your Trinity hymnal, 164. We will sing verses 1 through 6. Response of reading, taken from Psalm 123, printed in the bulletin. To you I lift up my eyes, O you who are enthroned in the heavens. As the eyes of a maidservant to the hand of her mistress. Have mercy on us, O Lord. Have mercy upon us, for we have more than enough of contempt. Our soul has had more than enough of the scorn of those who are at ease, of the contempt of God. Our hymn of worship is taken uh, from the back of the bulletin Come, bless the Lord.
This morning, we confess that we have not lived up to our authority. Despite our wise pursuits, we find ourselves in disintegration, disobedience, division, sedition, and sheer selfishness. We are not whole. We are not right. We are not gods who deserve praise, but mere mortals who constantly bring peril upon ourselves. Our Creator has called, covenanted, commanded, and commissioned us to better living. And this morning we come aware, we acknowledge, we accept, and admit our shortcomings and our failings. We come before the throne to publicly confess these shortcomings, our sinfulness and our sin, and all the ways that we haven't been who we are supposed to be. We will do this this morning in our unison confession of sin, followed by a time of silent confession of sin. Please join me in our unison confession of sin printed in your bulletin. Together. Almighty God, we confess how hard it is to be your people. You have called us to be the church, to continue the mission of Jesus Christ to our lonely and confused world. Yet we acknowledge we are more apathetic than active, isolated than involved, callous than compassionate, obstinate than obedient, legalistic than loving. Gracious Lord, have mercy upon us and forgive our sins. Remove the obstacles preventing us from being your representatives to a broken world. Awaken our hearts to the promised gift of your indwelling spirit. This we pray in Jesus' powerful name. Amen. Please take a few moments for silent confession. the name of Christ, hear the words of the one who, after being kept from the evil one, rearranged his life to preach the name of Christ and testify to his glory. From the Apostle Paul, if you confess with your mouth as Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart a person believes, leading to righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, leading to salvation. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not act hastily. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will not slip away. Amen. So as we confess our sins, we also come together with saints, past, present, and future, visible and invisible, to profess our faith, what the Lord has done and is doing and will do. This morning we will recite the Apostles' Creed, found on page 845 of your Trinity hymnal. Please stand.
joining together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Our responsive hymn this morning is Christ of All My Hopes, the Ground, found in your Trinity hymnal, page 518. We will sing verses 1 through 3. morning's Old Testament lesson comes to us from Daniel chapter 7. I invite you to follow along in your Bible or a pew Bible. Verses 1 through 18. <clears throat> in the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel saw a dream and visions of his head as he lay in his bed. Then he wrote down the dream and told the sum of the matter. Daniel declared, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea, and four great beasts came up out of the sea, different from one another. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. Then as I looked, its wings were plucked off, and it was lifted up from the ground and made to stand on two legs like a man, and the mind of a man was given to it. And behold, another beast, a second one, like a bear. It was raised up on one side. It had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. And it was told, Arise, devour much flesh. After this I looked, and behold, another, like a leopard, with four wings of a bird on its back. And the beast had four heads, and dominion was given to it. After this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, terrifying and dreadful and exceedingly strong. It had great iron teeth. It devoured and broke in pieces and stamped what was left with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. I considered the horns, and behold, there came up from among them another horn, a little one, before which three of the first horns were plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes, like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking great things. As I looked, thrones were placed, 
and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was white as snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was fiery flames, its wheels were burning fire. A stream of fire issued and came out from before him. A thousand thousands served him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court sat in judgment, and the books were opened. I looked then because of the sound of the great words that the horn was speaking, and as I looked, the beast was killed, and its body destroyed and given over to be burned with fire. As for the rest of the beasts, their dominion was taken away, but their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man, and he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall never be destroyed. As for me, Daniel, my spirit within me was anxious, and the visions of my head alarmed me. I approached one of those who stood there and asked him the truth concerning all this, he told me and made known to me the interpretations of the things. These four great beasts are four kings who shall arise out of the earth. But the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever and ever. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Well, it is wonderful to be with the Lord's body in the Lord's house on the Lord's day. And it truly is wonderful to have the Devlins joining us this morning. We are continuing in our series in the Gospel of John, That You May Be One. This morning, our text is John 17, verses 1 through 19. I invite you to follow along in your own Bible or either a pew Bible. And if you are able, please stand for the reading of God's word. Jesus spoke these things, and lifting up his eyes to heaven, he said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you. Even as you gave him authority over all flesh, that to all whom you have given him, he may have eternal life. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I glorified you on the earth, having finished the work which you have given me to do. Now, Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. I have manifested your name to the men whom you gave me out of the world, they were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they have come to know that everything you have given me is from you. For the words which you gave me, I have given to them. And they received them, and truly understood that I came forth from you. And they believed that you sent me. I asked on their behalf. I do not ask on behalf of the world, but of those whom you have given me, for they are yours. And all things that are mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I have been glorified in them. And I am no longer in the world, and yet they themselves are in the world, and I come to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name the name which you have given me, that they may be one even as we are. While I was with them, I was keeping them in your name, which you have given me. And I guarded them, and not one of them perished, but the son of perdition, so that the scripture would be fulfilled. But now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world so that they may have my joy made full in themselves. I've given them your word, and the world has hated them. Because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I do not ask you to take them out of the world, though, but to keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I also sent them into the world. For their sake, I sanctify myself, that they themselves also may be sanctified in truth. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, and we ask that you would open our eyes to see that you would be present in our midst and enlighten us so that we may apply your word in our lives. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. We are tackling one prayer with two directives this morning in our text. In the first verses 1 through 5, Jesus is praying for himself. 
essentially he is asking the father that he would give him what he needs, but not for self-directed purposes. He wants to be glorified by the, by the father so that he can, in turn, glorify the father. Give unto me so that I may give unto you. In the second directive, verses 6 through 19, Jesus prays that his disciples would get what they need. The Son is coming to the Father, and Jesus prays that the Father would guard and protect his disciples when he leaves. They need to be one, as the Father and the Son are one. Keep them, Father, so that they may do my work when I leave. This morning, we will focus on the second directive of this prayer, this priestly prayer. The hour has come, in verse 1, as we see, that the Son is going back to the Father. Before he does, he is coming to the Father in, in prayer on behalf of his disciples. As the Son, he has the authority to do so. He's in a special position. He has special footing to ask for their unity. We read in verse 10 that what is the Father's is the Son's. And what is the Son's is the Father's. The Son can ask anything from the Father and the Father will give it to him. As Martha notes in a few chapters previously. Jesus' disciples are the Father's too. And as their rabbi, their messiah, their lord, their high priest, all designations throughout the Gospel of John, Jesus asks for the Father to keep them and make them one. In a sense, as he's leaving them, he's handing them back over to the Father. He has kept them, he has protected them, and now he is handing them back to the Father. And the Father needs to keep, him, keep them, just as Jesus has kept them, as we read in verse 12. These are not strangers of the world, but they are those whom the Father once gave to the Son. He knows them, and they know him. And so, in the absence of the Son, when he is no longer with them, they need protection. They need unity. And Jesus is asking the Father to keep them. But what he's really asking is to guard and watch over them. To make sure they are safe. Do not let any of them perish, for they are yours, Father. Receive them. Now what's interesting is to keep them safe, Jesus is not asking the Father to take them out of the world. It is not their hour to ascend, but the Son's, as we read in verse 15. And mind you, his ascension is not an escape. They are in the world. They're not of it. But Jesus is sending them into the world. They are in the world, but they are not of it. But Jesus is sending them into the world. But they must and they have to be guarded from the evil one. Just as the Father sends the Son into the world to save it, so the Son sends his disciples into the world to preach the good news of salvation. And as they preach, because the world does not receive the gift of this word, his disciples are hated, as we read in verse 14. They need to be protected. They need to be comforted. They need to be guarded from the world and the evil one. As the Son has kept what the Father has given to him, now the Son asks the Father to keep that which the Son gives back to him. 
if the Father keeps them, they may be one as the Father and the Son are one. As we read in verse 11. The Father and the Son are united in a giving of back and forth. And so God's people are united in a giving of back and forth. Before the son leaves, he makes sure his disciples have everything they need to do. Everything they need to do, the work that the son has called, commissioned, and commanded them to do. The father will keep them. And the son will be, and the spirit will be sent to comfort, teach them, and help them remember all of the things the son has taught them. Moreover, as we read throughout the Gospel of John, Jesus will give them his peace, his love, and his joy. Here in our text, joy is emphasized. It's a theme throughout the Gospel of John. Jesus desires that his joy may be made full in his disciples. And what's so interesting about the word joy in this text and in any text in the New Testament is the link between joy and grace. Kara and charis. To be full of joy is to light, to delight in God's grace. So in the midst of the world's hatred and the roaming of the evil one, Jesus quite literally desires for his disciples to be crammed with joy, to see the grace, to appreciate the grace, to delight in the grace that is in their lives. Well, many of the academy kids have heard me say time and time again, when we exit a room or we enter a room, but right before we're about to exit, leave it better than you found it. A principle that I take to heart, and in our text this morning, there is a similar principle. That as the Father and Son are giving, and giving back, there is a way in which the Son always gives things back better. Better than he found them. But what we can't overlook in this text, in our passage for this morning, is how the Father and the Son are united in giving. The Father gives all things into the Son's hands, as we read in chapter 3, verse 35. And the Son takes care of all of these things and doesn't cast any of them out, as we read in chapter 6, verse 37. All the things of the kingdom... All the things the Father has given to the Son, who in the end will hand it all back to the Father, as Paul writes to the church in Corinth, chapter 15, verses 24. The Father gives, the Son receives, the Son gives back. And in our text this morning, there's four particular things that the Son notes he has received and what he's done with them. First, the Father has given the Son his name. And the Son has taken this name and manifested it. As we read in verse 6. That is, he has taken the Father's name and made it visible. Manifested it. So that it might be glorified. The Word, who was with the Father in the beginning, chapter 1, verse 1, has put flesh on the Father's name, so that it might be glorified and made known. The Father has given the Son men out of the, uh, men out of the world. Verses 2, 6, and 9. They were the Father's, and he entrusted 
them to the Son. And they are the ones who have been given eternal life. Verse 2. They have become the sheep who recognize the good shepherd's voice. Chapter 10, verses 28 through 30. What the Father has given to the Son, no one can snatch out of the Father's hand. The Father gives the Son a name. The Father gives the Son men. The Father gives the Son words. We read in verse 8. And we read in chapter 8, verse 28, that the Father taught the Son how to speak. The Logos, the eternal word, is given words. Taught how to speak. And then in turn, the Son gives these living words to his disciples in verse 8. He takes the word as the word and gives life to his disciples. And they receive this word and they take it in and live by it. The Father gives the Son a name. The Father gives the Son men. The Father gives the Son words. And the Father gives the Son work to do. His work was that they may have eternal life. As we read in verse 2. His work was to do the will of his Father who sent him. In chapter 4, verse 34, Jesus says that the work of the Father was his food. The bread of life takes the work of God, the Father, and makes it his food. He has come down from heaven to give life to the world. Chapter 6, verse 33. The Father and the Son are united in giving. What the Father gives, the Son gives back better. As disciples of Jesus Christ and those given from the Father, we are engrafted and invited into this inter-Trinitarian giving. As the Father did with the Son... So the Son gives us a name. He gives us brothers and sisters out of the world. He gives us words to live by. And he gives us work to do. Everything we have, everything we have is a gift from God. Every good and perfect gift comes from him, James notes. The earth and its fullness, the psalmist notes. All riches and all honor, King David notes. The days we live and the power we have to enjoy them, gift from God. Solomon notes, every single thing we enjoy comes from his hand, Paul writes Timothy. As I reflect on this text this morning, and the relationship that the Father has to the Son, and the call and the command that Jesus commissions to his disciples, I'm reminded of when Jesus said it is is more blessed to give than to receive. As we enter into a time of thanksgiving and waiting and anticipating our Savior, 
Do you believe that he was right when he said it is better? It is more blessed to give than to receive. Acts 20, 35. And it gets me wondering and thinking about how I hold his gifts. Does the way that I hold them compare with the master and the teacher and the savior and the creator that I claim to follow? How do you hold the gifts that God has given you? Do you ever give them back? In what condition do you give them back? Do you give them back in better or worse shape? I was thinking about all of the ways that we might give things. And three immediately came to mind. We can give back begrudgingly. We can give back indifferently. And we can give back generously. We give back begrudgingly when we hold on to things tightly. When we mistake his gifts for our possessions. We don't want to give them up. They've become ours. And we'll make any excuse to justify our apprehension. These are my kids. Mine. If I did share with him, he probably wouldn't appreciate it. He wouldn't appreciate it as much as I do. You might say we have a pearl before swine outlook. We can also give indifferently. We hold onto things too loosely. We mistake really, really good gifts for worthless materials, things to be jettisoned. Not that significant, and yet they are gifts from God. We don't care about something, and so we easily give it up. We squander it, we neglect it. Eh, it's just a job. That's just my opinion. We may be the swine who don't recognize the pearls. Or, or we can give generously. We can hold on to things tightly enough to make sure that they are given away well at the right time, in the right condition. They don't quickly slide out of our hands and don't fall through our fingers. We guard and keep them safe to give them back to the gift giver. We give them back in a better condition than we received them. Jesus Christ is our creator. He is our savior and he is our king. And as we read in Colossians, he has made everything. And as we read throughout all of scripture, he has sacrificed and given everything. He upholds all things and makes all things possible. What do we have that he has not given? What do I have? What do you have that he has not given? What do we have that we are unwilling to give back? Are we guarding and keeping, keeping safe what he has entrusted to us? Or are we hoarding? 
Are we squandering? Are we neglecting? Like the Father gave to him, Jesus has given everything, everything for you and for me. We cannot hoard. We cannot waste. We cannot be stingy with our wallets, with our energy, with our thoughts, with our food and drink. We have to guard and keep these gifts that he has entrusted to us so that we may return them generously. Better than we found them. More than what we received. My friends, if you are not tithing, you need to do so. If you're not serving your family and giving them due attention when you get home, you need to do so. If you're not thinking of creative ways to bless those around you, you need to do so. If you're not serving the best wine when you host families in this covenantal community, you need to do so. Give cloaks. Give cups of water. Give meals. Give encouragement. Give prayers. Extend his joy, peace, and love. Give without measure like he gives the Holy Spirit. Our Savior gave what no one else could. And he did not give it begrudgingly. He did not give it indifferently. He gave generously. He gave back generously. I want to glorify his name. Do you? Do you want to be one with him? I do. Do you want to follow him? I do. Then we have to stop worrying about what we will eat tomorrow. And we have to stop being stingy with what we have today. We have to give graciously, generously, like our God, our Lord, gives. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, we are grateful for the greatest gift that you could ever give. And Lord, we are grateful that you did not leave us alone. You have not left us alone. But you have sent your spirit as the comforter, as the advocate. Lord, you have given us a name. You have given us work to do. You have given us a covenantal community. Lord, may we take your word, the words that you have given us, yourself whom you've given us, and may we live in step with you and your spirit. And out of living in you, may we give back to you generously in this Thanksgiving and Advent season. May we manifest and magnify your name and witness to you in all of the giving that we do. For it's in your mighty name we pray. Amen.
At this time, I would like to call forward our ushers to receive this morning's offering. the good gifts that you have given to us. We ask this morning with our tithes and with our time, with our treasure and our talents, this morning we ask that you would advance your kingdom, and that you would be glorified with these gifts as we give them back to you generously. It's in your name that we pray. And I'd invite you to please stand for the threefold amen. Find it in your Trinity hymnal, number 518. We'll sing verses 4 and 5. in previous weeks, one of the disadvantages of not having a pastor in office, we are not able to offer a benediction, but hear the words of the Apostle Paul from the book of Romans. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such a harmony with one another, 
in accord with Christ Jesus, that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. Go in peace.